Hi again everyone. So I wanted to do a quick follow-up to my last video in the Don Defines Economic series and that one was Lesson 3 on Risk. Now, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to call this video yet. I guess you guys know, uh, but I don't know yet, so we'll see. Uh, it's not really Lesson 4, um, but I just wanted to do a follow-up to some of the comments in that video uh, where someone was making a point about the distinction between risk and uncertainty. And I thought that was an interesting conversation, so I wanted to uh, clarify that a little bit and also give a little bit more context on the perspective that I'm kind of bringing or that I'm seeing economics through uh, and to clarify how that sits in the whole you know, um, universe of economic thought. And I realize maybe that's something I could have talked about you know, as kind of the zeroth lesson uh, at the beginning, but I just wanted to get to the common sense stuff and not you know, get muddled in uh, some of the more arcane you know, issues in economic theory, but uh, I just wanted to take this chance to talk about those things a little bit. There's a, the first point, uh, the distinction between risk and uncertainty, one of the viewers made a comment saying, well, one thing that you missed in your video was explaining the distinction between risk and uncertainty, and she said that the examples I was giving of risk were actually examples of uncertainty, and that's worth clarifying. And if you read that thread of comments, I don't necessarily agree with the semantics of how to use those terms that, that she was using, uh, although I realize at this point uh, that that's somewhat common in economics. A lot of the things that are common in economics, in my opinion, are a bunch of bunk. Uh, so that's, that'll be the second part of this video where I explain kind of my perspective on economics. Now this issue is not a bunch of bunk, um, it's just a question of semantics. So it's perfectly fine, maybe, maybe her semantics are better. Uh, but the, the fundamental concept is that there's a difference between what, what, what she would call risk, which is where you know what the probabilities are, you just don't know what the outcome is going to be. So if you're betting on a flip of a coin or if you're betting on a roulette wheel in Vegas, you know with certainty you know, what the probabilities are of the different outcomes. They're definitionally, definish, definitionally known uh, at the outset. Um, so that's how the casinos make so much money. They know before you even make a bet on roulette that they have a statistical edge. They're not paying you the fair odds given what the actual probabilities of hitting black or red are. Uh, if you bet someone on flipping a coin, you know, you can be pretty sure that it's about a 50-50 chance whether it's going to come up heads or tails. So if you, you know, place a wager on something like that, well, you're taking risk, but, but you know what the probabilities are. You can calculate the risk precisely. Whereas uh, she was suggesting you use the term uncertainty to refer to uh, situations where you don't know what the underlying probabilities are. Uh, so for example, betting on Phil Mickelson to win the US Open, uh, the Vegas bookmakers will offer odds on that. They'll say he's 3 to 1 or 10 to 1 or 50 to 1 or whatever it is. But you don't really know what the actual probability is. It's uncertain. Um, so it's sort of like the difference between a known unknown and an unknown unknown, right? In the, in the roulette wheel example, it's unknown what the outcome is, but it's known what the probability distribution is. In betting on a golf match or investing in Apple stock, for example, uh, you don't know what the outcome is and you also don't know what the underlying probability is. Okay, so that's uh, it's an interesting distinction, right? It's important to understand that there's a difference between knowing probabilities and being uncertain about the outcome and, and guessing at the probabilities as well as the outcome. Uh, I don't think it's the most important distinction or the best use of the term risk because in the real world of economics outside of casinos, you almost never know what the underlying probabilities are. To define the term risk so narrowly as to only apply to the circumstances in which the probabilities are known definitionally beforehand makes it so that we can almost never use the term. Uh, and that just isn't intuitive to me. When we think about risk, it's like, well, I bought a house and I have the risk that I might lose money on it, you know, or I have the risk that I might lose my job or I might get injured and not be able to work or et cetera, et cetera. All of those things are, uh, you know, uncertain, not only in the outcomes, but also in what the, what the underlying probabilities are. We can do a lot of 
guessing and estimation based on past experience as to what those probabilities are. But I mean, just to take the housing uh, example, you know, for a generation, it was sort of the conventional wisdom that you buy a house and housing prices go up over the time and it'll be the best investment you ever make. Uh, yet, you know, over the last 10 years, we've got a lot of people uh, who are underwater on their mortgages. And so we're seeing that, you know, those patterns don't always hold. Now, maybe, you know, in 10 years from now, that'll turn around again. Maybe it won't. It's hard to say. Your guess is uh, as good as mine. Well, some people's guesses might be better than others, but we have to remember that they are all guesses. So, you know, again, that that is a really important point, recognizing that, you know, just because the conventional wisdom is you get 8% returns in the stock market and this kind of stock bond allocation is appropriate, or if a stock trades at a certain PE, that's overvalued or undervalued. All those things are not anything like a roulette wheel. Uh, they're, they're heuristics, they're, they're estimates, and they're guesses. Okay, so interesting enough. Now, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to say, though, is that uh, the, the person who made this distinction about risk and uncertainty happened to say that, happened to call that a Keynesian distinction. She called, she said, I prefer the Keynesian usage of the term risk and uncertainty. And that just strikes a chord with me. Uh, to me, Keynes is sort of a dirty word. Uh, now, John Maynard Keynes is, you know, one of the most widely, uh, I guess, I don't know how many people actually read him, but Keynesian ideas are behind almost all of the economic policy of almost every, uh, you know, U.S. government administration, for example. Uh, the monetary and fiscal policy that Bernanke and before him or, or Bernanke and, uh, and Paulson and Geithner and, and Obama and Bush, what all those guys did in response to the economic crisis is exactly what the Keynesian um, prescription is for, for dealing with those kinds of situations. I think it's a bunch of bunk. I think it's complete nonsense. Uh, if you actually try to read Keynes, he contradicts himself on every page. Uh, this, when I was first learning economics in school, they were teaching those ideas and I, was, I wanted to be interested in the topic because I cared about, you know, the economy and how markets work and that was interesting, but the stuff just doesn't make any sense. So I'm not going to go through, like, the litany of Keynesian fallacies now. Um, I'll do that at some point if it's interesting to people. I can recommend some books on it. But the approach I wanted to take with this series is more just like, I kind of, as I've said, from the ground up based on common sense just how do we think about economic concepts and you don't have to bring in any of those the you know the, the Keynesian ideas to do that uh, so I hadn't done so but this just seemed like a good point to kind of just explain where I'm coming from there's you know so the other thing you learn about at least when I did my Econ 101 you learn about Keynesian economics and neoclassical economics which is sort of built on that and then you learn about Milton Friedman and the monetarists who you know, are better than Keynes on some issues, in my opinion, but still really miss a lot of the, the fundamental contradictions that are a part of that broad body of thought. Um, the guys that get it right, in my opinion, are uh, known as the Austrian economists. Um, so that goes back to Karl Menger in, you know, Vienna in the 1800s. Uh, Bohm Ball work after him. Ludwig von Mises, who was writing just after the turn of the century, uh, is sort of the giant of the Austrian school. Murray Rothbard studied under Mises. Rothbard is much easier to read, in my opinion. He was a prolific writer uh, during the during the 1900s, um, the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, maybe 60s, 70s, 80s. He I don't he passed away uh, 15 years ago or something like that. Anyway, uh, the Austrians really get it right, in my opinion. Um, that body of work, and they have a fundamentally different approach to economics than a lot of the other economic thinkers, uh, and it's what Mies says called praxeology, which is the logic of, of human action um, that's derived from the action axiom. So basically, the Austrians are saying that you can deduce every important principle of economics just while sitting in your armchair and starting with the basic realization that human beings are volitional creatures that act with purpose. Um, that's 
that's an idea that's basically impossible to refute because if you try to refute it, you're demonstrating that you act with purpose. <laughs> uh, it's not to say that we choose our purposes well. It's not to say that we're good at achieving them. It's only to say that we do act, and when we act, it's towards an end that we've chosen and with the means that we think will best help us achieve that end. Um, people often confuse, people often think that assuming that man is a rational being means that we always have perfect information to make good decisions, which is obviously not true. Uh, even when we have good information, which is usually not the case, we frequently don't use it very well. Uh, so it's like, you know, it's irrational for me to, you know, eat a cupcake when I'm trying to lose weight. Well, sure, uh, you know, it's not a good idea, but the all the, accent, all the action axiom says is that when I reach for a cupcake, I'm demonstrating my desire to reach for a cupcake, right? The irrational thing would be to try to eat a cupcake without picking it up or putting it in my mouth, right? That would be irrational. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't make any sense. Uh, so the action axiom is just that we're volitional creatures. We act with purpose. And you can deduce every important principle of economics from there. And if you happen to do an experiment that seems to contradict one of those principles, it's more likely that that there, there's other, under, there's other uh, variables affecting the results uh, than it is that the axiom is wrong. There's other schools of economics that try to look at you know, economic data, the whole, um, uh, yeah, uh, this is too long. How do I bring it back? So, sort of uh, an alternative view to praxeology is what I've heard referred to as logical positivism. And this is the idea that, you know, we can infer economic laws from empirical observations. And, you know, to be clear, by saying I'm a praxeologist or an Austrian, I am not denying the importance of testing theories against empirical data. Uh, I'm a big believer in the scientific method. However, when people try to take that view strictly with economics, it tends to fail because you cannot conduct economic experiments the same way you can conduct chemistry experiments. experiments. There's no laboratory where you can control all the variables except for one and then see how it affects the chemical reaction and then redo the test over and over and over again, see if you can repeat the results. That's how the scientific method works in the laboratory. There's no laboratory for social human action. You can never go back in time and try something different. And so it's just not a rigorous way to build economic laws by taking some period of data and inferring a relationship between things. So, you know, for example, there's an I let's just take one one thing in it, one concept, which is minimum wage, right? So the the basic economic concept is that if you impose a minimum wage, fewer people are going to be employed. Now that's with the assumption that the minimum wage is relevant, that it's above what they would call the market clearing price. If you impose a minimum wage of one penny a week, or say you increase it from one penny a week to two penny a week, two pennies, it's probably not going to affect employment because everyone was already getting paid more than that. But if you have a minimum wage that's at $10 an hour and you increase it to $20 an hour, uh, it's certainly going to be the case that the, the demand for labor will be lower at that price. Uh, that's a basic law of economics and we'll, we can talk about how it's derived from the action axiom later. Uh, but the logical positivists would say, well, we don't know, let's test it out. And if you happen to have a uh, let's say that at the beginning of the year the minimum wage is increased and then at the end of the year there's actually more people employed than there were at the beginning logical positivists would say well that concept of, of minimum of how price floors affect demand uh, the whole of how price affects demand is invalidated by this experiment perhaps the audience would say no <laughs> there were 10,000 other things changing about the economy during that period so uh, there's a Latin phrase for this in economics, which is ceteris paribus, or I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right, but it means with all other things remaining the same. So when an economist makes a statement about how a higher minimum wage will reduce the demand for labor, that's an all other things remaining the same statement. 
and he, he, he can make it, but he can't predict what the actual magnitude of the change would be. It, minimum wage goes from 10 to 20, how much less labor will be demanded? You do not know. Uh, you can certainly estimate, but there's no economic law. Keynes is always trying to come up with these multipliers uh, that to try to put a coefficient on it and say this is what the relationship is, and that is always a function of time and place, even if you are measuring it properly, which is a, a challenge anyway. So, the uh, you know, if, it, another example of sort of an axiomatic statement is a ball cannot be red and not red all over at the same time, right? Uh, if a ball is red all over. It can't be not red all over, right? This is just basic, like that's Aristotelian logic. A is A. It's not not A. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's not not what it is. But a, a logical positivist would say, well, but I saw a ball once and it, it was red all over, but then there was a spot that wasn't red. So clearly that can't be true, right? And that's just, it, you have to reject that observation. You have to say, you know, maybe there was something in your eye. Maybe there was a weird shadow. Uh, but it can't, it can't be read and not read all over at the same time. It just can't. <laughs> uh, so the, the Austrians take that kind of perspective to economics. They start with logical, um, they start with just one or two basic axioms about what it is to be a human being and then try and derive logical principles from there. Then we're always testing them against our experience. But because there are so many variables and human social interaction is so complex, trying to analyze economic data without starting with a with an interpretive lens with a theory is extremely challenging you can sort of end up proving anything you want um, so i think it's very important to start with an analytical framework that's based in reason that's based on you know things that are axiomatic that's what the austrian school is so that is you know i'm not a formally trained economist but i've read a lot of austrian economics and i've read you know, I, I did the intro to, to neoclassical economics and I've, I did the intro to monetarist economics and I've tried to read Friedman and Keynes. I've read books that analyze those guys. Uh, so that's the perspective that I'm coming from as we get farther along and we start talking about money and credit and interest rates. Uh, invariably, I'm going to be contrasting some of these things against like the conventional wisdom that the government operates under, which tends to be Keynesianism. So I just kind of wanted to get this out there uh, to let you guys know if you want to do any of your own research or whatever, ask me questions about those things. Uh, you know, I love the questions. So um, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'm planning my next Don Defines Economic lesson to be about capital. And I think I'm going to try and explain capital and liquidity in the same video. Liquidity is a, a very important concept in economics and in markets and in finance that uh, I think the general, you know, if you're not a practitioner in finance, it's very hard to understand what liquidity really means. It's not always used precisely on CNBC, but it's a very important uh, idea um, and it's a, it's a valuable thing, liquidity. Uh, so I'm excited to talk about that in the next video. Um, hopefully you'll, you'll come along and watch it. And uh, like I said, um, thanks for watching this one and please leave a comment. Uh, see you next time.